So, last weekend we played Sunderland. It was a nil-nil draw, a very boring, lacklustrous game. Now after watching some Sunderland fans' videos about the game, you know, their analysis and their post-match review, they all kind of said the same thing. And Charlton Athletic are the poorest side I've seen play Sunderland so far this season. Charlton Athletic were absolutely rubbish today. With no disrespect to Charlton, uh, I'm really not just saying this in a bitter way, but they were considerably the worst team we have played so far this season. My choice! But I have to <laughs> My choice! This got me thinking, what do I, as a Charlton fan, expect from the Addicts this season? Now the simple answer to that question is, I'm not expecting miracles. And to be honest, I don't think any Charlton fan should, considering the circumstances of our club in the last couple of months. Obviously, before the season started, we were tipped as one of the favourites to go up. One of the bigger teams in League One coming into this season. So, naturally, we were expected to go straight back up. In my League One prediction video, I predicted us to finish sixth as a bare maximum as to what I felt the squad was capable of doing over the course of the season. I wasn't expecting us to win the league. I wasn't expecting us to get automatics. And I wasn't even expecting us to get the playoffs. But... I backed us to do it because that was the only source of positivity that I could put into Charlton at that point in time. Now, after watching most people's prediction videos, many people were going with the same observation that we were going to get playoffs, automatics, or we were going to win the league. One prediction that stood out for me, though, out of all the ones that I saw, was one by Cod's Vlogs or Ben Natman, who predicted us to finish in 14th. And after four games of the 2020-21 season, that is where we are in the league table. 14th, with one win, one draw, and two defeats. Three goals scored, five conceded. Now, if I'm being totally honest, this is precisely what I expected. I expected us to take the hits in the first few games of the season. Of course, as most of you know, we were under a transfer embargo when the season kick-started, and we were only allowed to have a 23-man team, which is the bare minimum that you have to register before an EFL season. So we were stuck with that. And to make up the numbers, we had to include players that hadn't even broken into our under-23 squad, our development team, let alone the first team. Players like Charlie Barker, James Vennings, Aaron Henry, who wouldn't naturally get into the first team, had to play due to our limited squad numbers. Of course, we kicked off the season quite well with a 2-0 win over newly promoted Crew Alexandra. Now, I'd admit that result was a surprise to me. I didn't expect us to win the game 2-0. We started the game slow. We grew into the game after the 25-minute mark. We pounced on their mistakes, showed ruthlessness in front of goal, took a 2-0 lead into halftime. Second half, Crew battered us, and they should have really scored, and maybe even should have got an equaliser. So I did feel Crew were hard done by by the scoreline, but I'll take the three points nonetheless. We then played Doncaster at the Valley, where we where it was the exact opposite. We started strong, but then a long shot from Magic Gomez caught out Ben Amos, and we never recovered after that. Doncaster showed their ruthlessness, and they battered us 3-1 in front of 1,000 Charlton fans. Third game, we played Lincoln City away from home, and again, like the Doncaster game, we started very strong. First half, completely dominated them. I felt we were much the better side in the first half. And then in highly controversial fashion, the Imps took the lead from the penalty spot. And after that goal went in, we completely capitulated. We looked flat, we looked lethargic, and they pounced on a mistake when we fell asleep at the back, and they pounced at the back post and took a 2-0 lead. Thoroughly deserved. And then, of course, the latest game we played was against Sunderland, which I've just touched upon. Very boring, very dull, not many chances in the game from our end. We had four shots, none on target. Sunderland had way more shots than us, but could not finish their dinner to save their life. Danny Graham smashed a shot in the six-yard box way over the bar. Amos got forced into a brilliant save from a Tom Flanagan header, and we had to throw our bodies on the line quite literally. It was a very poor game to watch. I don't think either side particularly played that well. Sunderland were the better team, but they were the best of two poor sides, in my opinion. Now, with these four games, there is a recurring theme. Charlton have been the second best on the pitch in all of our games so far. As Charlton fans... As I said, it's something that we'd expect. Now, during this transfer embargo period, we'd signed three players. Alex Gilby, Connor Washington and Dylan Levitt. Now that the transfer embargo has been uplifted, we've now been able to sign players. Under the Thomas Sangard era, we have seen Ben Watson, Akin Famuo, Marcus Madison, and today, on Thursday, we've signed our seventh player, that being right-back Chris Gunter. 
Now, all of these signings, it's safe to say, has had mixed success coming into the new season. Alex Gilby has by far been our best midfielder, in my opinion, that, without a shadow of a doubt. The way he commands the centre of the pitch is absolutely fantastic. He darts forward brilliantly. He's had a couple of shots where he probably should have bagged a couple, and he also got the first assist of our season. And knowing Charlton's luck, our best, one of our best players just had to get injured, didn't it? You couldn't really script this. Unfortunately, Gilby is out with an Achilles injury, and he is set to be out for another five weeks, so that takes him out of action until probably the middle of November. Despite me being very critical of him when we signed him, Connor Washington Washington is actually our top scorer, which isn't an achievement because we've only scored three goals this season and he's got two of them. So that's not really an achievement at all. But he certainly has been our best attacker coming into the season and I've been impressed with him. Against Sunderland though, he was played as the lone striker and that is something that Washington cannot do. He cannot be utilised as a target man. That's not his game. He needs a strike partner up top and that's something that we lacked in the Sunderland game. One word I'd use to describe Dylan Levitt probably would be overhyped. I think Manchester United's claims that he is the best passer at the club. By all means, I can see that in part of his game. I do see glimpses of that. His vision can be good, but most of the time he's given away stray passes. His free kicks have been terrible. And for the most part, I've barely seen him on the pitch. As for the signings that we've made under the Thomas Sangard era, Ben Watson was certainly an impressive signing. And to be honest, it was one I didn't really expect. He, of course, was the captain of Nottingham Forest last season. A very, very good Nottingham Forest side under Sabri Mucci, who missed out on the playoffs last season. And he come off the back of a pretty good season. And some Nottingham Forest fans even went as far as saying on Twitter that he was arguably their best player. Famuo comes into the club as an unknown identity, really. He's come on loan from Norwich City, having not really featured for the Norwich side at all. He got his move to Norwich from his performances at Luton Town. He spent last season up in Scotland with St Mirren. He is 21, 6 foot 3, absolute unit in the back line. Marcus Madison, on paper, by far our best signing. He's in the conversation for the best League One player in the last five years, and there's no, there's no debate about that at all. The goals and assists he got for Peterborough during the the time he was there is absolutely fantastic unfortunately he didn't really do well with Hull City to be honest he barely played because he was one of the players who refused to play during the behind closed doors period last season he comes to Charlton a fresh start a good CV about him a very very good talented league one player at this level capable of playing in the center of midfield and out on the right wing where he was utilized when he came off the bench against Sunderland for the last 10 minutes he has to be one of the first names on the team sheet by far and I'm really looking forward to seeing what he can do. And as for today's signing, Chris Gunter from Reading, of course, 31 years old, very experienced player. He's played his entire career in the Championship and 25 appearances in the Premier League. He is the most capped player for Wales in their history with 97 caps. And it is a player that we've badly needed in this squad because, of course, we don't have a right back. And Gunter has now filled that role. Most people have been quite critical of him. Some people saying he's not very good. Me, personally, I will admit I've not really heard good things about Gunter. But when he's played his entire career in the Championship and he's never played in League One before kind of makes you think that he is too good for this division. So to get him on a two-year contract is certainly good business and obviously it is a position that we've needed badly. And I'm looking forward to seeing Gunter play. Obviously, we were looking at signing Adam Matthews, who of course is a fellow Welshman. And to be honest, I will admit, I, would, I did want Matthews to come back and probably would have preferred Matthews. But Gunter is ahead of Matthews in the Wells team. And as I've said, most capped Wells player of all time. I mean, it's pretty good to have on your books, especially for a League One side, a division he's never been in before because he spent his entire career in the division above. So, Gunter for me, good signing. Looking forward to seeing him play. Now, if you're not a Charlton fan and you look at those signings, you might think that Charlton have had a pretty decent transfer window so far. The fact is, though, those seven signings that I've just mentioned they're not enough. And we lost a ridiculous amount of players coming into the summer. I think it was 14 in total. The 14 players we lost included six lone players. Josh Cullen, Sam Field, David Davis, Ada McGeady, Andre Green and Matt Smith. All of them departed the club. Lyle Taylor and Chris Solly both refused to play during the behind closed doors period. They had 12 months left on their contract so subsequently they left the club on free transfers. Taylor signing for Nottingham Forest where he's not exactly had the best of times there, has he? <laughs> and Chris Solly has not found a club yet. Not all too sure what's going on with him. Lewis Page and Tomer Hemed were both released upon the expiration of their contracts. Hemed has yet to find the club, while Page has signed for Exeter in League Two. We saw, despite Bowie's wishes to keep him, couldn't afford his wage due to the salary caps, uh, but he's gone to Huddersfield Town in the Championship. Tom Lockyer activated his relegation clause and, in his contract and assigned for Luton in the Championship, again on a free transfer. Adam Matthews departs the club, obviously, and the most recent departure being Macaulay Bon. Of course, he scored 11 goals in the Championship last season, a joint top scorer. He signs for QPR for £2 million plus a sell-on. 
and we got him for 200k from Leighton Orient 15 months ago. I can't help but feel gutted that Bon has left, but let's be real, it is an unbelievable business deal for Charlton. Two million pounds to QPR. We've absolutely ripped them off there. I am a bit gutted that Bon has gone, I won't lie to you. However, Ultimately, he wanted the move. He even said in an interview that his head was turned when QPR wanted to sign him. And judging by his performances in the first couple of games of the season, you could see that. I mean, he looked so isolated up front. He looked like he just didn't give a toss. He certainly wasn't a 20-goal-a-season striker. He wasn't an unbelievable striker. He wasn't amazing. Considering Taylor's injury at the start of last season, he had to come into the side. He took his chance brilliantly. But then he just sort of faded away after that. He wasn't an amazing striker, but I do wish him all the best at his time at QPR. It is bloody typical, though, that he goes and scores a 96-minute equaliser against Sheffield Wednesday on his debut. Like, again, something you just couldn't script. Now, I did plan on recording this video earlier on in the week, but I'm recording this on the Thursday. And earlier on in the week, we didn't have a first-team right-back, but we now have one in, of course, Chris Gunter, who joined today. By the sounds of it, Boyard doesn't want to bring in another right-back. It looks like Gunter is going to be our only right-back acquisition. And the reason, and I think the reason why, is because we do have players that can play in that position. George Lapsley, the central midfielder, is capable of playing at right back, and also centre back Stejo Shilaja, who can play anywhere across the back line, and Charlie Barker. Now, by the sounds of it, Boya, Gallon, and Sangard want to bring in another left back, as we currently have only one, that being Ben Purrington. And I don't really fancy having Ben Purrington as our first team left back, and only left back for the entire season, because. I mean, have you seen the guy? Recently, the club have been heavily linked with signing a left-back, that being the former Burnley left-back, Ali Koike. He's 21 years old, and he never made a professional appearance for Burnley. He went out on loan at the end of last season to the League 2 champion Swindon Town, where he made 15 appearances. Now, this was his first ever taste of professional football. He was quite a late-comer when it comes to coming into professional football, and he has been on trial with the club recently, following his release from Burnley. Played in our pre-season friendly against South United, United at Sparrows Lane and I believe he featured against Crystal Palace as well and most recently he played in the under 23s game against Millwall I think it was last week we made a breakthrough in the negotiations with signing him I believe Sunderland were in the race to sign him as well but it looks like that we are going to get him over the line and if we are going to get him over the line I expect it to be announced probably this weekend now in terms of Koike, he is a young player. He's younger than Purrington, so obviously this is, I think this is a good addition. We need a left-back cover. However, not only will this be his first proper full season in professional football, it's also his first season at League One level. So that is a concern that I have. However, it is the depth that we need. We do need at least two left-backs. I mean, the only other player that can play left-back is Dej Yoshilaja. And to be honest, I'd rather not him play at left-back by his performances last season in the Championship. But yeah, we can't have Purrington as our first-team left-back throughout the entire season. We need that cover. Now, this one's going to be up for debate, but I do think that we could do with another centre-back. We have four centre-backs at the club. Jason Pearce, Dej Yoshilaja, Akin Famuo, and Charlie Barker. Pierce is currently injured. Charlie Barker is our fourth choice centre back at the moment. He didn't play against Sunderland. Barker's played right back in the League One games he's played this season against Crew, Doncaster, and Lincoln. He's been one of the most impressive players we've seen so far this season. He he definitely looks like he's been playing in League One for years. He looks massive for a 17-year-old. An aerial threat. He's even scored a goal as well in the Carabao Cup first round against Swindon. Our defensive line isn't great. It's not great, let's be honest. I mean, Pierce. We need him badly. We need a leader in the back line. I think he's going to be good. I think that Pierce's partner in our defensive line is Famuo. I know they're both left-footed, but let's face it, I'd rather have Famuo over Oshilaja as centre-back any day of the week. Now, Charlie Barker, as impressive as he's been this season, it's clear that our defensive line needs improving. I'd like to get your guys' thoughts on this in the comments. Should we sign another centre-back or should we leave Barker in the squad and leave our current centre-back choices of Pierce, Famuel, Oshilaja and Barker for the full season? Let me know in the comments below. Now, there is one area of the pitch that's been absolutely shot to bits recently, and that is, of course, striker. We currently have only three strikers registered to our squad. Connor Washington, Chuck Sanike and Josh Davison. Washington, our current top scorer... Anike recently coming back to full fitness after testing positive for COVID-19. He's now back in the squad and a much, much needed body in that team. I mean, he came on against Sunderland and made the most impact. And of course, Josh Davison, who featured a couple of times in the championship due to the injury crisis that we had, but has yet to play in League One this season. Now, Boya did say that when we had Bon in the squad, we were going to bring in one more striker. Now that Bon's gone, we're going to need two. And we're going to need two very, very good players. After the departure of Bon, we've got £2 million to spend. And we need to stamp our authority with this signing. We need a goal scorer. And we were heavily linked 
last week with Danish striker Ronnie Schwartz. Of course, he plays for FC Midtjylland, who were the Danish champions last season. And I, uh, to be honest, I expected this to happen. I expected at least some Danish talent to come over. Now, Schwartz, 31 years old, he'd be the oldest striker to come into the club if we were to get him. But of course, as we all know, the deal fell through. The international transfer window shut on Monday and we now have a domestic only window where we can sign players in England until the 16th. So the Schwartz deal isn't happening. Now, to be honest, I didn't expect it to go through considering that Mitterland are playing Champions League football this season. So if he was to leave a European side to come to the third tier of a country that he's never played in before. He is deranged. I wasn't all that keen on him anyway. I mean, from what I heard from him, he got in the right place at the right time. He was scoring the goals. He can get you goals. The only thing he has to his game is being a poacher. I would like someone that's got some a bit, that's got a bit of flair about him, a bit of flair, a bit of technicality. Someone like Jonathan Lecco that we had last season, someone like him at this level, I think could be a very, very good player. I wasn't too keen on Schwartz, but we needed the striker and we didn't get it. So now we have eight days to sign two strikers. There hasn't really been any players we've been linked with recently, but we need to get deals done. And I can't help but think that chances are the strikers that we are to bring in are going to be loans because we do have three loan slots left. The only players we've signed on loan currently are Levitt and Famuo. So we do have loan spots available. And if we can't sign anyone on a permanent deal, which we haven't been linked with anyone recently, I think chances are it's going to be some loan signings for us and preferably some Premier League youngsters. Boya said he wants to get a mixture of youth and experience. And obviously we've got experience in the squad, obviously, with the signings of Watson, Gunter. We are undergoing a massive rebuild at the moment of course it's the rebuild that we needed and it's not going to happen overnight you know and it's it's going to take time you know Thomas Sangard has these ambitions saying you know we're going to blow right through league one but I think he also has a realistic mindset he knows that it's going to take a long time and that's why Sangard is here for the long run and he understands that he gets the fans and he's ready to back Bowyer and Gallagher as I said before at the start of this video the short answer to the question is, I'm not expecting us to get promoted. I'm all but preparing for us to play League One football in 2021-22. And the reason being is just, it's going to take time. It's going to take time to rebuild. It's going to take time for the squad to gel. As you all know, we go back to the 2018-19 season when we got promoted. The first, when we got promoted, at the start of the season, after the first five games, we were in the exact same position we're in now. 14th with one win, two draws and two defeats. In November, we were 11th. So it's going to take time. We were nowhere near the playoffs in November and then we shot up the table. Boja got the squad together, the squad gelled and we flew up the table and we got promoted. And if we go even further from the first time we got relegated to League One in 2009, since the 2009-2010 season, we've, been, we've had two different stints in League One. They all lasted three seasons and they each ended the same way. We finished 13th in one season. We made it to the playoffs but didn't get promoted in the second season, in another season. And then we eventually got promoted. And I can't help but feel that maybe history will repeat itself. Maybe we are in League One for quite some time. And I asked you guys on Instagram last night, actually, I was saying, what do you expect? And most of you, and pretty much it all come back with the same thing. Playoffs, just missed out on the playoffs or mid table. It was one of those three, like between 6th to 13th was the main bracket that we were expected to finish. And I completely agree. I seriously do agree. It would not surprise me in the slightest if we were to finish in 14th, where we are right now. As I said in the start of this video, I expected us to take the hits. I expected us to lose to Crew for God's sake, and we proved, and thankfully we got the win, but it is our only win so far. And a lot of people are saying like, like we're one of the biggest clubs in this league. We should be aiming for promotion. By all means, we could, uh, by November, we could still be mid-table. We could go unbeaten for the rest of the season and then piss the league. But that's not what I'm expecting us to do. The transfer window shuts on the 16th. We're not playing another game until then. So we have eight days to sign, uh, as a bare minimum, four players. A left-back, a centre-back and two strikers. They're the positions I think we needed. And while we're at it, let's address the elephant in the room as well. Dylan Phillips. In my opinion, Phillips needs to be sold. No questions asked. This now needs to be a priority throughout this window. He doesn't want to be here. He's got 12 months left on his contract. It, he, he doesn't want to sign a new deal. He doesn't want to be here. So let's sell him. Let's get him out of the door. With 12 months left on his contract, it will have a factor. It will have an effect on the end fee. 
naturally, if he had a decent deal ahead of him, I'd say Phillips would be worth at least like three, four, maybe even five million. Even with 12 months left on his contract, I expect to get at least a couple million out of him. I know most fans don't want Amos to be our starting keeper throughout the season. Neither do I. But after his performance against Sunderland, it shows that he can be good at this level. That was the best performance I've seen him play in League One since his stint back in 2018. We have another good keeper as our backup currently, Ashley Maynard Brewer, a young player. Very, very good shot stopper, and we saw that against Brighton under 21 in the EFL Trophy where he saved two penalties and we won on the shoot and we won in the shootout. Bottom line is, if Phillips doesn't want to be here, we sell him and we add to the budget so we can sign top quality defenders and top quality attackers. That is what I expect from Charlton this season. To summarise, not expecting us to get promoted. I'm expecting this rebuild to take time. As I said, it's not going to happen overnight. These players need to gel together and when they do, we will be up there and we'll be competing. But as I've said, it won't happen immediately. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, can you possibly leave a like, subscribe if you're new around here, and turn on those post notifications so you're notified of when I post. We are so close to 2,600 subscribers. I think we're 29 away the last time I checked. So if we could get to that, that'd be absolutely awesome. Charlton fans, what do you expect from Charlton this season? Let me know in the comments below. Also, ch people, those of you who are watching this video that aren't Charlton fans, what do you expect from Charlton this season? Do you expect us to be up there? Do you expect us to be a mid-table? As I've said... I think as a bare maximum, we're going to just sneak in the playoffs. As a bare minimum, mid-table. We're going to finish in the 6th to 13th bracket. That's my observation. It's going to take time. We need players to come into the squad. We need to get rid of Phillips, sell him. He doesn't want to be here. Add to the transfer budget. Stamp our authority in the transfer window. And then if when these players do gel, we'll have something special and we can kick on. Thanks for watching this video, guys. This has been Tyler Renson. Have a nice day and I'll see you all in the next video. Take it easy, guys. See you later.